I am, I am too loud for myself. All right, everybody, come on in. Have a seat. Get relaxed. Get a seat, please. Join me. We have very, very little time. Not a lot of time at all. Very, very little time. So I want you to come on in, have a seat, sit down, relax, take your shoes off. Maybe don't take your shoes off. It might smell. But, you know, everything else. Just do what you're going to do. Be relaxed. Be comfortable. Uh, and, uh, you know, Take a photo of this slide. This slide is the one slide that you should focus on. It's the one slide that you should care about because it has all the information about what you are going to need in order, in order to be able to follow along later on. So here, we have my Git repository. We have my Twitter coordinates. We have my email. So how many of you are using Twitter? I'm just curious. Twitter, 2019. Twitter, 2019. Twitter. All right, uh, the rest of you, get on it. What are you doing? It's a great place to be. It's the new IRC. It's where the developers that drive the open source that power your business are. So you should be there. Join us. It's, it's, a, it's our, per, our privilege and pleasure to talk to you. What about email? How many of you are using email? Anybody? No, good, moving on. I'm not really a big email fan. I think uh, I have to soften my position on this a little bit. I have to take a less adamant, a less rigorous position on uh, email. I'm not a big fan of email, but I prefer it to Slack. So that's nice. I have a, I have a brand new MacBook Pro. This is a MacBook Pro with 32 gigs of RAM. I bought it last year so that I could run both Slack and Chrome at the same time. 32 gigs of RAM. That's very nice for me. Now, a little bit about me. My name is Josh Long. I work on the Spring team. I'm an open source contributor and, uh, uh, you know, number one contributor of, um, of, of bugs, but still number one. Number one contributor to all the bugs in all of the Spring projects. There he's got. If you're on WeChat, that's, there's that. Uh, I have training videos on Safari. It's an all-you-can-eat technical marketplace. Lots of videos. These are five, six, seven, eight hours long. Different uh, in detail, in depth discussions of different topics. I have a book called Cloud Native Java that I wrote in 2017. It's available in four languages English, uh, Chinese, Korean, and Russian. So that's cool. I think I'm doing a book signing afterwards, uh, so find that. Uh, the book is something that I'm very proud of. It's something that I worked on for a long time. The book is all about how to build applications that work in the cloud with Spring Boot, Spring Cloud, and of course Cloud Foundry. And these, this book is something that I expected to be able to finish with my co-author very quickly. I expected maybe six months. But it did take a little bit longer than that. It took just a little bit longer than six months in order to finish this book. And there's a lot of reasons why a book like this might be delayed. I cannot say exactly what is the cause, but there's just, it was only a little bit of a delay, a very tiny delay, not a very big delay at all, okay? It was just a little bit more than six months. I was thinking six months, maybe a little longer, and it was not, it was not a big deal, not a big deal, a very small delay, not a not a, okay, it was like two years, okay? It was two years delayed, two extra years to get this darn book out the door. But there's a reason for this, okay? The reason is that we spent a lot of time as authors. We had a long debate, a long debate that went back and forth over and over, deciding eventually for 18 months and almost two years, deciding on the animal on the cover. Now, Anybody who knows anything about O'Reilly books knows that it does not matter what's in the book itself. Nobody cares. If you look at the reviews for all the different books, if you look at the different comments, all the, all the comments are all about the animal on the cover. And so we eventually discovered what animal we wanted on the cover of this book. We chose a blue-eared kingfisher, a bird with blue ears, a bird that is only found in the Indonesian Java Islands. It's a bird that's only found in the Indonesian Java Islands. It's native to the Java Islands, right? So it's a bird that's only found in the Indonesian Java Islands, and it's a bird, and birds fly, yes, through the clouds, through the clouds. So it's a bird that is native to Java that flies through the clouds. It's a cloud-native Java Bird. It's a bird. Never mind. It'll come. It'll come. Give it time. So there's that. 
I have a podcast every Friday, a podcast on uh, iTunes, on Google Play, whatever. It's called A Beautiful Podcast. You can find it there and uh, subscribe in your podcast listener. Uh, different people. The episode that was just made available yesterday, every Friday, yesterday the episode was on uh, Growl and JVMs and JITs with Chris Thallinger from Twitter. So there's that. Uh, and of course, I do videos every Wednesday, a, a new introduction to a new topic on YouTube. It's called Spring Tips, and you can find the playlist there. And finally, I've got a new book called Reactive Spring, and this book is all about how to build applications that take advantage of reactive programming. You have heard about reactive programming some at this wonderful conference, right? You've heard about uh, reactive programming a few different times, if I'm not mistaken. You've heard a lot of good stuff. And there's even one more talk coming after this, I think, from, I think it's Ole, right? So that'll be cool. Lots of good stuff on reactive programming. Reactive programming is a new answer to an old question, an old problem. The problem is, how do I handle more users? How do I handle more scale? And the reason that we have this problem is because we have Internet of Things. We have microservices. We have mobile clients, APIs, API-driven applications, things like iPhone and Android and HTML5 browser clients. The more, it, the more clients that we have, the more demand that we have on our services. So we need to handle more demand. And so the question is, how do we handle more demand? Well, one, uh, one way to do this, of course, if you have an application that is a 12-factor sort of microservice, it's stateless, it has uh, easy replication, and it's, it's, it's not hard to, to scale out horizontally. If you have this kind of microservice, then one easy answer is to just add more instances of the service and put it in the load balancer, right? That's a nice answer, because when you do that, you have to buy more application instances. I love that answer. That answer makes me happy because I work for a cloud computing company. We love it when you buy more app instances. But is that the best answer? No, right? So think about what, why we need more app instances. What, why can't we just have more users with the same computer, the same instance, the same uh, node? And the reason we can't have more instances is because at some point, we run out of the ability to handle more users at the same time. The number one reason that we run out of that capacity is because we don't have more threads. In a traditional application, threads are linked to our number of users. So we have one user, we have one thread. If we want to have more users, we have to have more threads. This is a bit of a problem. It means that you're going to uh, very quickly run out of users that you can handle. So you have to spin up and create more instances. So the thing is, we need to be more efficient with those threads. We need to make better use of those threads. One way to do this one way to do this is to make sure that we don't spend a lot of time on those threads so that others can reuse those threads. Okay, so what do we do? What do we spend time on threads for? What takes the most time? Right? Input and output. That's what most of us spend time doing on threads. We call other microservices. We talk to other databases. We're waiting for data to come back over the network. As we're doing this, we're sitting there waiting for the bytes. Where are those bytes? Where's my data? As the data comes, we wait, we wait, we wait. Meanwhile, other people are trying to get in and access the server. They're trying to make requests. We need more threads, and you're just sitting there waiting. You've got a thread all to yourself, and nobody else can reuse it. This is because most of the software that we have written uses traditional synchronous blocking input and output. There's an alternative here, though. There's asynchronous I.O. Asynchronous I.O is this idea that instead of blocking and waiting for the data, we ask for the data, and then we get off the thread. We finish immediately. We don't get the data back immediately. The data comes eventually in an interrupt or a callback. When the data is there, then we process it. This is a different style of programming. And unfortunately, it's a little bit more complicated. And so in order to deal with this kind of programming, we need a different way of describing data. Instead of using Java util collections or arrays, these things are good for synchronous and blocking and small amounts of data. But they're not good for large, unlimited, potentially asynchronous, latent data. So we need something that allows us to describe that. This is why several years ago, four, four years ago or so, many of the different companies in this space, Pivotal, Netflix, uh, Lightbend, the Eclipse Foundation, all these different organizations, we got together and we created the uh, the reactive streams specification. 
Four very simple interfaces. Are those reactive streams types enough? Are we done? Is that enough? Can you go to production with just that? Probably not, right? And the reason is because those types are very simple. They don't support operations. They don't support flat map and map and uh, filter and all these kinds of things that we want to do on streams of data. So what do we do? Well, there's a project, Reactor, from Pivotal. Reactor provides operators that sit on top of the reactive streams types. That makes life easier. Is that enough? Still no, right? Because again, we need these things to be integrated in the different technologies that we use to build software. Our data access, our web tier, our security layer, etc. All the microservices that we build. So if it's not available at every layer, then we're not going to use it, right? It's not going to be very convenient. If it doesn't work well in those environments, then it, it, it makes no sense. So the question is, what do we do there? In 2017, the Spring team released Spring Framework 5, the first version of Spring to support reactive programming end-to-end -end natively. Then we released Spring Data K and Spring Security 5 and Spring Boot 2.0 and Spring Cloud Finchley and all these. Oh, yeah. Good stuff. We released all that different software to support these APIs. Now we have the ability to build end-to-end -end systems with reactive programming. And so my friends, that's what we're going to talk about today, is how to build reactive programs and to build reactive systems using the Spring ecosystem. And of course, in order to do that, we're going to start here, at my second favorite place on the internet, my second favorite place after production. I love production. You should love production. You should go as early and often as possible. Bring the kids. Bring the family. The weather is amazing. It's the happiest place on earth. It's better than Disneyland. But if you have not been to production, you can begin your journey here at start.spring.io. That was cool. There was music. If you need inspiration in the early morning before a cup of tea or coffee, Start that spring that I owe. If your children are restless and they cannot sleep, start that spring that I owe. And if you suffer from indigestion, a sour stomach, after a long night of alcohol abuse and web sphere, start that spring. .io. So we're going to build a new application. We're going to use Spring Boot 2.0, 2.20 M3. Okay, there's this. We're going to bring an application. We're going to call this a reservation hyphen service, like that. Good. We're going to use Lumbach. We're going to use the reactive web support. We're going to use the reactive MongoDB support, uh, and uh, we're going to use R socket support. Okay, that's enough for now. I'm happy with my selections, so I'm going to hit generate, and that's going to give me a new project that I'm going to open up in my IDE. So here it is, UAO reservation service.zip. I'll open this up. And that's going to open my IDE. It doesn't matter what IDE you use. I'm using IntelliJ. NetBeans works just fine. Eclipse works just fine. All of them work just fine, OK? There's nothing special about them. You need to support uh, at least Java 8 or later, and, uh, and of course, uh, Gradle, if you want, or um, uh, uh, Maven, and, uh, and then there you go, right? So you have a, a, a brand new project, very simple project. We're going to build a new application. We're going to go to our build. I forgot to specify Java 11. So now the only sane version you should be using is 11 or 12, okay? So Java 8 is very, very old, very, very old, dead basically, expired, no longer available. Terrible idea. Don't use this at all, okay? How many of you are using Java 12? Java 7, oh, this makes me want to take a shower. No, 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 don't use Java 7. Here we go. I've got now uh, a, a, a uh, program. I'm going to make the font a little bit bigger here. Let's see, 22. Can you see this, everybody? Okay, good stuff. So we've got a brand new application, and we're going to be using a, we're going to build an application that writes data to the database. I've got MongoDB running in the background. So I'm going to say private string ID, private string name, and it's going to be a document object. It's going to have a field here called at ID. 
And it's just going to be a very simple object that writes data to the database that has a primary key, and it's going to have a name field. Now, I want to have uh, getters and setters and two string and equals and a hash code. So I could do this. I could just create all that. I could uh, do the uh, constructor. There we go. I can create the getters and the setters. Good stuff. Equals and hash code. So modern. Look at that. Ugh. Look at this. All this code for nothing. Look at all that nonsense. This is why people leave IT because of this. No, no, no. Instead, I want to use Lumbach. Lumbach is a nice compile time annotation processor. It allows me to synthesize or to create the, the information at compile time. So that's kind of nice. Now I'm going to create a repository. A repository is an object that handles the, the data access logic. So repository is going to extend the reactive CRUD repository. It's going to have an entity of type reservation whose primary key is of type string. This interface provides methods that will be automatically provided for us when Spring starts up. It'll create an implementation of this interface that supports the common methods, save, save all, find, find by ID, check if it exists, count, delete, etc. All these methods uh, will return certain types of values and accept certain types of values. The first is a publisher. A publisher is part of the reactive streams. It's a specification that, I, that as I said, was created by four different companies. The reactive stream specification provides a publisher which publishes data, a, a single item or multiple items of type T. T is the generic part. And it gets published to a subscriber. When the subscriber consumes the data, it is given the next data in the onNext method. When there are any errors, those are passed in the onError method. And when the method is done processing, when the, when the uh, subscriber is done processing all the data, the onComplete method is called. So th these are callbacks that are called by the publisher on the subscriber. Now, notice that we call these errors. Because remember, errors, when you do this kind of processing, when you process streams of data, it's very functional. Errors are not special. They are not exceptional. Right? They don't have their own control flow mechanism. You handle errors in the same way that you handle any other kind of data with a callback. When you are given a subscriber, uh, sorry, when you, are, when you subscribe to a publisher, you are given a subscription. And the subscription is very important. The subscription is probably the most important part. You see, now we are, not, we are no longer pulling the data from the producer of the data. We're no longer taking it from the thing that is giving us the data. Instead, the producer of the data is pushing us. It's pushing the data to us asynchronously at whatever frequency, whatever interval it wants. And so we don't know when we are going to get the next record. And so we have to be very careful that we don't get surprised. We don't want to have too much data. We don't want to have a billion records all in one nanosecond, right? And so this is why you use request. Request allows the subscriber to request more records from the producer. It allows the subscriber to ask the producer to slow down. OK? This is very useful. It's called flow control. It's not a new idea, right? Ever since there was one computer on the internet talking to another, you had flow control. Now, in the context of flow control, we call this flow control, but this is also called back pressure. Back pressure is a marketing term. It's not a technical term. It's a marketing term that means the same thing as flow control. So here we have flow control. And this helps us build more reliable systems. Our APIs are given the opportunity to focus on the fact that there are errors, which is true, right? There are errors. We now have a built-in way to think about that. And there is flow control, which is also true. We, but we now have a way to think about that in our code. If we want to cancel the production of data, we call cancel. Good stuff, huh? So those types are from the reactive stream spec. There's also a fourth type called processor. And processor is just a bridge. It's a source and a sink, a producer and a consumer, a subscriber and a publisher. That's it. That's all four types. That's the entire reactive stream specification. If you understand that, congratulations. You are certified reactive. Go ahead. Go to, move to Silicon Valley. Start a startup. Raise a billion dollars in funding and then burn out in six months. Right? You're ready. You already know the, more than most engineers in Silicon Valley if you understand this. But is that enough? I think these types are nice, but they're very basic. They're like Java arrays. Most of us don't write code using Java arrays. We think about things using higher order operators, things like the Java 8 Streams API. 
right? So this is why when you use reactor from Pivotal, you have two specializations. One is called a mono. A mono is also a publisher, right? See, it extends core publisher, which extends publisher or reactive streams. A mono is a publisher that produces zero or one record. So it's like a completable future, but it supports asynchronous processing, and it's also uh, got back pressure, OK? There's also a flux. A flux is also a publisher, but it provides zero into a li unlimited data. So zero, one, two, three, five, ten, 10, 1,000 records. It could be a, a trillion records. It could be unlimited records. But either way, it's also a publisher. This is like a Java 8 stream, but it also supports asynchronous programming, and it supports back pressure. So these are both specializations of publisher. So our advice is that you accept publishers, but you return fluxes and monos. Right? That way, you can accept anything that produces a publisher. So remember, Netflix's RxJava 2, Vertex from the Eclipse Foundation, uh, Aqua Streams from Lightbend, and um, uh, Reactor. All these different APIs can all speak publisher. They all understand this, this basic API. So you can interoperate. So now we have this interface, and it supports data access. Let's write some sample data to the database. Okay. And it's going to be a thing that listens for an event like this. Go. And we're going to start the application. It's just going to be a spring bean. It's going to listen for events. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to inje inject a reference to my reservation repository here. Now, I want to inject this into the constructor. I can do that like this if I want. Or, or I can do required args constructor. That's Lumbach. Again, I quite like that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say flux.just. And I'm going to create some names. So it'll be. Um, uh, Let's see. Ole, good. We got Josh, good. We've got uh, Marcin, good. Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of some other names here. Um, oh, yeah, Jacob, there you go. So there's some names. Uh, we've got some other engineers on the Spring team and the Reactive Ecosystem team. Uh, okay, good. And good. OK, so we've got now uh, eight names. I've just created a reactive stream with names in it. And what I want to do is I want to visit each one of those names and turn them into a new reservation. So name, new reservation, null, name. OK, and there's our reservation objects. OK, and so I'm creating streams as I go. Now I want to say for each one of these, I want to save each one into the database using the repository. Now save here returns a mono, right? It's a mono. And when I create map, what I get is actually a flux of mono of reservation. I don't want that. So instead, I use flat map. And the result is I get rid of the intermediate publisher. Okay, So now I've got a stream of data here that is going to be written to the database. Now, this is actually very verbose. Normally, I don't keep these in three different lines. In this case, you just compose it. So you say var names, that's Java 11. And then you say. Get rid of this, get rid of that. OK, much better. So now, what happens if I run this code right now? Nothing will happen. You see, this code is a cold stream. It's not hot. It's like, a, a, it's like pipes. You put the pipes together. There's no water going through the pipes yet. We have connected the pipes. We have defined the flow, but there's no water going through it yet. So we call this a cold stream. In order to activate the stream, you subscribe. So you provide a new subscriber or a consumer, right? And a consumer lets you log out the results. So I'm going to create a logger using Lumbuck. And I'll say log.info uh, reservation. Okay. Now, of course, this can be rewritten as a lambda and that as a method reference. Nicer. Okay. Now, what happens if I run this? Well, if I run this one time, then we're going to see that in MongoDB, we're going to have a document. That in a document is a single row in a collection. A collection is like a table. So I'm going to write data to MongoDB. If I run it one time, we'll see eight different names in the database. If I run it two times, we'll see 16. Three times, 24, etc. So this will go on forever and ever and ever. I don't want to do that. I want to delete all the data and reset the database. So I want to say this dot reservation repository dot delete all. Well, that gives me a mono. If I have a mono, I have to subscribe, don't I? But subscriptions are asynchronous. When I subscribe, this could be on thread one, and this could be on thread two. 
We don't know. And so as a result, this may finish after this, right? There's no guarantee here. So I want to force, I want to force one thing to execute before the other. Can I do this? Ugh. Here, I have this nice reactive API, but I'm blocking. No, 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 no. This is a terrible idea. Instead of doing that, you use the operators. So here, I have an operator called then many. And then many lets me take things like this publisher here, and then this here. I'm going to subscribe to that here, okay? So now, what I'm doing is I'm deleting everything first, on what, and, and it could be on one thread. Then I'm writing everything to the database. That could be on another thread. And then I'm reading all the data, and I'm logging each result as it comes back. I don't have to worry about whether it's going to execute correctly, because I've used these operators. Even though there's multi-threading involved, I don't have to worry about getting the, the flow correct. I don't have to worry about whether one thing will be ordered before the other. It's guaranteed to work. I have the operators and all that already in place. So now I can just run this and go. Now, I am using, I am using uh, uh, these reactive APIs because I don't want to worry about threading. I don't want to worry about uh, you know, uh, cyclic barriers and phasers and countdown latches and runnables and semaphores and threads and executors and executor services and so on. I don't need to worry about that. It's just done for me automatically. So did it work? Did it work? Look at that. Look at that, my friends. It worked. What about here? in MongoDB. Dot find. Okay. There we are. It's in MongoDB as well. All that data is there. It worked just fine. Of course it worked. It was a demo. What were you expecting? That was always going to work. That's not why we're here. What I wanted to talk to you about is this. This is the Spring Boot ASCII artwork. And this artwork took a long time to get right. But we on the Spring team have many people who are doctors, PhDs, people who used to work in nuclear physics. Very smart people. So it makes me very happy to imagine that someday, somewhere, somehow, there was a GitHub issue, and they said, we need better ASCII artwork. And I think you can agree, they did a great job. So it's for this reason that I want to take out one moment, just one moment, to talk about what I consider to be a very serious bug in the IntelliJ JetBrains product. Do you see this right here? This bug? This one right here. Do you see it? Do you see it? That, that one right there? This one. This one right here. Do you see that? That right there. Do you see that? That right there. Do you see that checkbox? When you click that checkbox, it disables the ASCII artwork. What the hell? Why is this there? That's a bug. I don't even know why they put that there. Nobody even asked you, JetBrains, okay? Nobody even asked for this. It's a terrible feature. So I did what all people would do in this situation. I went on the internet and I cried. And I sent out a message of pain and I was given a message of hope from my friend Jan Sebron. Jan Sebron is a software developer by passion at JetBrains. This is him right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. Right here. <laughs> Boop. Jan Sebron, he sent me this message of hope, which I want to share with you here today. This is the message that he shared with me today, or that made me happy. He says, I shall distribute a patch that fixes this to the correct behavior as soon as possible. <laughs> Disabled by order of Josh Long. And I want to believe him, you know? He's a friend. I want to trust him. I want to believe that he's right, that he's not lying to me, you know? I have known him for a long time. He keeps saying, Josh, don't worry. It'll be in the next release. It'll be fixed. Just relax, Josh. It's going to be fixed soon. Just relax. The next one will have it fixed. But you know what? I'm starting to think just maybe, just maybe, maybe, maybe he's not being true. I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. Anyway, 
We have amazing ASCII artwork. We have data in the database. Now, so far, I have been using MongoDB. Now, Mong Spring supports uh, Spring Data supports a number of different uh, reactive databases. We support uh, MongoDB, which is a great choice because it has support for transactions and for tailable queries and all that kind of stuff. It supports um, uh, it supports geospatial records, it supports all that good stuff, and it does so very nicely in the Reactive API. That's nice. We also have uh, support for uh, Couchbase, for Redis, uh, and for um, uh, oh, Cassandra, right? So all of them are natively reactive. This is not the same as the regular Spring Data uh, drivers. These are reactive driver implementations that are built on top of native reactive or native asynchronous I.O. drivers. So that allows them to go faster. But not everybody is using MongoDB, right? It's a good choice, but I think a lot of us are probably still using SQL. How many of you are using SQL? Okay, yeah, that's not going to go anywhere. And so the question is, how do we use SQL from a reactive application? You cannot use JDBC. JDBC blocks. It's synchronous and blocking. If you want to have more users, you have to create more threads, which is a problem. We can't do that. So. One way to get around that is to use a natively reactive SQL data store. And so we have a project here called R2DBC. R2DBC. And R2DBC is an API that provides an implementation of an SPI and some drivers, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, H2, and there's even a MySQL one, right? And there are more coming. These are different drivers that talk to these different databases built on natively asynchronous database drivers. Okay, so we can use that in our application. Now, keep in mind, R2DBC is not yet GA. It's not yet integrated into Spring Boot. And so we need to do a little bit of work here. We need to go here and add some code to our, our application manually. Okay, so I'm going to add these manually. I'll go back to my build. I'm going to comment out this part right here. I'm going to comment out MongoDB. And I'm going to add R2DBC. So I'll add this down here. That's the Spring Boot Dependencies R2DBC Bill of Materials Maven BOM, B-O-M, Bill of Materials. Okay, And we're going to add this property here, so spring.r2dbc.url. And I'm going to point it to my local database. And then we have R2DBC Postgres. We have R2DBC Pool. And we have the... Um, uh, Spring Boot Starter R2DBC and Spring Boot Starter Data R2DBC. With that there, and with this connection string, we can write code that now connects to R2DBC. So I'm going to say R2DBC configuration. I'm going to create a bean whoops, of type connection factory. And connection factories dot get. I'm going to inject the Spring R2BC URL, so spring.r2dbc.url uh, string URL. Okay, so here we go. Good stuff. So there's our configuration class that defines how to connect to our Postgres database. Uh, and we need to change some things, of course. This is no longer a MongoDB document. And also, we're not using a UUID. We're using a primary key, an auto, you know, auto, uh, a monotonically incrementing primary key. So we create that and make that an integer. Uh, and then this will be an integer as well, so here we go. Now I have MongoDB here, p sql, orders, orders. You can see I've got this bunch of stuff, so uh, delete from reservation. Okay, reservation. And there's the schema, it's got an integer and a car name. So name is var car, ID is an integer. And that's the same thing as I have here, integer ID, name string. So I'm going to now run this program again. We've changed it to use R2DBC. Whoops, I have to get rid of all the old types that don't make any sense anymore. And then rerun it. I had to clean out the imports. OK, and so now select all from reservation. There we go. So now we're using a SQL data store in a reactive way as well, OK? So good. We've got data in the database. I want to build a web API, OK? Now, by the way, it's important to know there's also support for transaction management here, right? You can do resource local transactions. There's a, there's a generic API that you can use to, to uh, read and write data in a transactional way for both MongoDB and for R2DBC. It's the same API. So you can use the transactional operator to enclose units of work in a transactional boundary, or you can use at transactional on your methods, and that'll work just fine. Now, I want to create a web API. And so 
one way to do this, of course, is to use Spring MBC style. So reservation, rest controller, like so. And I can inject the reservation repository. And we create an endpoint here called at git mapping, forward slash reservations. And it's going to be a publisher of reservation. And so you just use that, right? I'm just going to say find all. And there's my new endpoint. I'm going to inject that argument into the constructor. And there's my Spring MVC style con controller. When somebody comes and asks HTTP git, they're going to call this endpoint, and they're going to get reservations. And that works just fine. You know, it's OK. But the thing is, uh, reservations, the thing is that I don't really, uh, I don't, you know, I don't always want to use this style, right? I might want to use the new functional reactive style. So this is okay, but it, since we have Java 8, we can use the new functional reactive style, and that looks like this. You just create a bean, class HTTP config iteration, okay, at bean router function server response routes, and it's a configuration class, right? So you say return route dot git forward slash reservations. Good stuff. And uh, we're going to just now create a handler function that responds to the data. We're going to say return a new server response dot ok dot body. And we're going to inject the reservation repository. So there's my repository as a collaborating object, as a collaborating function dot find all reservation dot class. And there we go. That's good stuff. Good stuff. Good, much cleaner, OK? So now I have an HTTP endpoint, listens for HTTP git, forward slash reservations, and then this Lambda gets invoked. And I can add other ones. I can do post and delete and whatever. I can do as much as I want, right? I can create, I can have all the routes in one bean, and then I can use method reference as well. This is a Lambda, but I can also use a method reference. And so that, that's just fine. Also, this could have lived here. I could have just done that as well. It doesn't have to be in a separate class. Now, I've got the new API. Let's go ahead and restart this. This is fine, right? All I've done is I've showed you how to use the new Spring WebFlux API to create HTTP endpoints that are reactive. But this is only eight records, right? Not a lot of data. Who cares about eight records? I could have done this with the servlet API and Spring MVC. Remember, this is not the servlet API. There's no servlet engine on this class path. We're using Netty. Right? This is a brand new reactive web runtime built from the ground up to support asynchronous streams of data. Now, all of that is pretty simple. I could have done this before. Is this what I want? Well, no. I want to actually take advantage of asynchronous I.O. Asynchronous I.O. Uh, uh, is, one, you know, is great for long connections. So what can I do besides this? Well, one thing I could do is WebSockets. So WebSocket config, OK? I'm going to create a simple URL handler mapping and a simple, uh, sorry, WebSocket handler adapter. New and a WebSocket handler. Okay, like that. Now, um, I am going to use this simple URL handler mapping to tell Spring how to map this application to a endpoint. So greetings like this. And I'm going to inject WebSocket Handler, WSH, there, WSH. And I'll say set order equals 10. And there we go. So there's my mapping. And the WebSocket Handler is this bean right here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create an endpoint that produces a greeting every second. So it'll be a, a greetings producer. Okay. So I'm going to create a, uh, a greeting here, public or just a flux, really. And it's going to be an object that produces a greeting type, greetings request, greeting response. Whenever somebody asks me for a greeting with a greeting request, I'll send them a greeting response with a message in it. OK, so here's the data. And it'll be at data, at all args constructor, at no args constructor. Just copy and paste. Good stuff. There we go. And I'm going to create a new thing, greetings uh, request. Greet, greetings request, OK? And I'm going to make this a spring bean. Uh, good stuff. So I'm now I've got this. And um, I'm going to just create a reactive stream that's infinite. So I'll say from stream, generate a new stream like this. And I'm going to stagger each element by one second. So it's going to be a new greetings res re response, uh, a, new a new greetings re response. Here we go, wrong one. 
like that, like this, like that, okay. Uh, and then, uh, hello. And then we'll use the name and the request at instant dot now, okay? Okay, so there we go. I'm greeting somebody every second forever. It'll just keep going. It's an infinite stream of data. So here's my actual code, okay? New re it's a new stream of data every second. It'll produce a new value. I'm going to use that greetings producer here in my WebSocket code. So here's my greetings producer. I'm going to inject that here to depend on that. And I'm going to create a WebSocket application. So when the client connects to the WebSocket service, I'll get a new WebSocket session. And then I can use the session to say, oh, let's receive any incoming messages, map the incoming messages to some text, turn each one of those, uh, each one of those texts uh, as a re into a request, right? So this is the name of the person we want to greet, so it's a new greetings request. And then turn each one of those requests into a stream of greetings, right? So here we go, uh, gp.greet, greeting request. And then we want to send that back. By the way, I can use lambdas here. Then I want to send each one of those back. So I'm going to take each one and turn it into string. And I'm going to send each one of those back as a WebSocket text message. So I have the string and turn it into a session.text message. Okay, string. Good stuff. So there's my entire session, my inter entire interaction with the WebSocket service and client, so it responds, okay? And I'm going to send that to the, s the client using session.send. There you go. That's my entire WebSocket application. It's a chat, basically. I send a name in, it sends me greetings back. Okay, now this, of course, could be var. That's nice. Uh, good. Now, in order for me to test this, in order for me to demonstrate it to you, I need to create a I need to do something that I'm not proud of, something that I'm, not, I'm, I'm a little ashamed of, something that I don't want you to do, but I need to do it to show you how to do it, okay? I need to write some JavaScript. So here we go. Static. Static. File ws.html. HTML. Body. Script. Window.add event listener. Load. Function. E. And then here, WebSocket localhost 8080 forward slash ws forward slash greeting. So I'm creating a WebSocket client, and when the web WebSocket object is connected, I'll get an on open callback, and then when there is new data, I'll get the on message callback, okay? So this is the message. I'm going to log out the result when the new message arrives, new greeting, message.data. And when there is data, when, when the socket is connected, I'll use the socket to send a request. I'll say var name to greet equals window.prompt. Who should we greet? Okay, name to greet. So I'll send that, and then it, as, the rec as the responses come, I'll, uh, I'll log them out here. So let's restart this application. And the uh, application is at ws.html. Who do we want to greet? Uh, let's say uh, Kim Lee, my daughter. There you go. So look at that. Right? New greeting every second in the WebSocket application. A new WebSocket stream. This is going to create new values forever. It has no end. Okay? It's an endless stream. But in between each second, that thread that's being used to produce the data, somebody else can use it. We're not wasting time on the thread, keeping that thread forever. Somebody else can reuse that thread to produce data, to handle more requests. So reactive programming gives us a way to handle more users with the same computer, with the same hardware, with the same CPU. So you can do two things. Either you re reduce the cost of your data center bill, because you can reduce it by a lot, or you can handle many more users. Either way, it's a good situation. Now, this is a WebSocket service and an HTTP service. I want to build a an edge service, okay? An edge service is a thing that is the, it's the first port of call. It's the first door into your architecture from the outside. So your iPhone, your PlayStation, your Xbox, your Android devices, all of these things will talk to the edge service, 
and then the edge service forwards the request to the downstream microservices. And so these microservices are all pretty similar, but the edge service can take the different clients and normalize them so that they are the same for the downstream services. So we're going to build a new client here, like so. And we're going to build a new service, a new client called reservation-client. Client, okay. We're going to use our socket there, Lumbach, Reactive Web. Okay, might use Gateway. Uh, and there we go. So I'm just going to build a very simple gateway, a, a very simple edge service. Here we go. Okay, open that up. Come on. It's thinking really hard. There it is. So now in my reservation client, I want to build an, a thing that's going to listen for requests coming from the outside, and we're going to send them a client-specific view. This is where you can create views of the data that clients can look at and work with. Okay, so let's say that we wanted to create a new HTTP endpoint that only returns the JSON names. So not the whole reservation object, just the name. So I'm going to create an endpoint here. I'm going to create a, a reservation client that's going to call our microservice. And this reservation client is going to take data of type reservation from the service and then process it. Okay, So here we go. In order for us to do that, I'm going to use a reactive HTTP client called web client. So this is a Spring Bean web client. I'll inject that here. Good stuff. And I want to have reservation, so I have to do something that I'm not proud of, something that you should never, ever do, ever, not even when you are all by yourself at home and no one is looking. I am going to copy and paste code. Okay? Oh, terrible. So sad. So, greetings response, greetings request. There we go. So I've copied and pasted my types, my data types here. Uh, I don't need anything else. And with that, I can create a reservation client, and the client is going to return the uh, data. I'm going to say dot .get dot .uri localhost 8080 forward slash reservations dot .retrieve body dot to flux reservation dot .class. There's my reservation client, and now I can use that to create a edge service, a, a view of the data. So uh, reservation HTTP, or whatever. Actually, I can do it in here. Why not? Bean router function, server response, routes, route, build. All right? Get forward slash reservations. And so what we're going to do is we're going to actually a, um, we're going to return just the names. So it's not the reservations, it's the names. And in order to do that, I'm going to make a call to the downstream service using the reservation client, RC. So I'll say return server response dot OK dot body, RC dot, uh, and we're going to call the downstream service. We're going to say RC dot get reservations dot map to the string name. Okay. So there's our stream of data. Okay, I'm going to send that back. So map string.class. Okay, now I'm making a network call here. I'm making a call over the network. Is this always going to work if I make a call over the network? Well, of course not, right? I'm using the network. Things are going to fail. When you build distributed systems, fa things may fail. So you have operators here. You can say, oh, if something happens, then I want to handle the exception. I get a, a, a new function, and I say, when there's a, a throwable, then I get a chance to produce a new value. So I can say, eek, right? So now I'm handling the degrade. I'm degrading gracefully. I'm handling it. I can also say, look, you should retry 10 times. The service might not respond the first time, but maybe it will respond the second time. And if it does, you know, if it doesn't, keep retrying. Or even better, I can do retry and then a back off. I can say retry 10 times, and then each time, wait one more second longer, right? Like this. So I'm waiting one more second. So you have lots of ways to build robust code here. So this makes your services more ro reliable. But OK, I've got a, uh, an endpoint. OK, let's see what that looks like. Localhost 8080. Sorry, uh, this is going to run on the wrong port. I have to change the port. So server.port will be 9090. OK, go. 9090 forward slash reservations forward slash names. Come on. Oh, I need to define the bean, web client. So here's this. 
Builder, builder. Good, restart. So now, so there's our names, right? No, it's just the names. It's not the whole JSON thing. That's interesting. Now, this is a very simple example of me streaming data. I'm, I'm sending data from, a, uh, from the server to the client. This is great for HTTP, but what if I want to do more efficient communication from one node to another? What if I want one service to talk to the other one more quickly? What if I want to support bidirectional communication? Instead of sending text files, I want to send binary data. Right? What if I want to do uh, a stream of data in and a stream of data out? Well, these things are all much harder to do with HTTP. So for a lot of organizations, they're looking for ways to scale out and go faster. Google created gRPC, for example. That's kind of interesting. How many of you have heard of gRPC? gRPC, OK. Google created that. It doesn't do reactive. It supports asynchronous, but not reactive I.O. So one thing that Salesforce have done, there's another company, they created a reactor-based compiler plugin that generates reactor-based services for gRPC. That's kind of interesting. There's another company called Facebook. Do you know Facebook? Anybody have Facebook? I don't really use it. I don't know what it's for, but apparently it's pretty popular. They are trying to build services at scale as well. And so they created a, a protocol called RSocket. Now, RSocket is a binary protocol, and it supports four message exchange patterns. Single value in, single value out, single value in, multiple values out, multiple values in, multiple values out, and single value in and no value out. Okay, So you can do all sorts of different things with it. It's a binary protocol. So I'm going to create a RSocket server. This is not HTTP. It's RSocket. And it's possible because I have Spring Boot Starter RSocket on the class path. So I'll say controller class rsocket greetings controller. And I'll say that this is going to be mapped to the greetings endpoint. And I'm going to return a publisher of greeting responses. So you saw that I've got that, that already set up there. And all I'm going to do is I'm going to just inject my greetings producer here like that. So I'll say return this.producer.greet greetings request. There you go. There's my RSocket server. The only thing I need to do to use that is I need to have an RSocket server port. So I'll say 7070. Good. I'm going to restart this. And then on the client side, I want to create a new endpoint that will stream that data. So when somebody goes to the greetings endpoints, and I want to send server sent events on the client. Okay, so I'll pass in a name here. New handler function. And the handler function is going to use this new client that I'm going to build called the greetings client. And the greetings client will act as an RSocket client, not a web client. So I'll use the RSocket requester. This is the equivalent of the web client, but for RSocket, I'm going to inject that there. It's going to be a regular spring bean. I'll have the required args constructor. And here, I'll just say flux of greetings uh, response greet when somebody sends me a greetings request, OK? So I'll say return this.requester.route greetings dot data. And the data that I'm going to send in is the request. And the data that I expect to come back will be a greetings response dot class, OK? So there's that greetings client. In order for this to work, I need to have a bean of type rsocket requester, just like I have a web client here. So I'll say rsocket requester. I'm going to say rsocket requester dot builder builder. And I'll say builder dot connect tcp client transport dot create 70 70. OK? So there's my new thing there. Uh, dot block, good. And then in order to use that, I'm going to create, I'm going to call that service. I'm going to call the rsocket service in my code here. I'm going to inject the rsocket greetings client. Greetings client gc. And I'll say gc dot greet. Uh, and I'll get the path name equals server request dot path variable name, OK? String name. And I'll say create a new greetings request with the name. And that'll give me a stream of greetings responses. And I want to send that never-ending stream back to the web client using server send events. This is a, a, um, a way of sending data that uh, it's, a, it's pretty inefficient, but it's a good demo. So we'll use that, OK? So greetings response dot class. And the only thing I need now is content type equals text event stream. So I'm actually bridging. I'm actually calling rsocket for my service-to-service -service communication and then adapting it to HTTP very easily in my edge service. And go. 
So now, localhost SSE uh, greetings names. Greetings, and I'll use Minsk. Okay, so there's my endpoint. Whoops. Oh, uh, it's on port 9090, isn't it? So that's the edge service. There we go. So now I'm bridging reactive streams data coming from our socket for efficient communication for my services. But if I have open web clients, they can talk to the edge service, and that works just fine. Reactive programming allows us to build more robust systems that are also more efficient, and they don't take more code. Thank you so much for your time. Pasibo? Uh, Pasibo? Something like that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm signing a book, I think, after this. So please find me there. I'm not sure where that is. Do you know? I don't know. If you want to sign the book, uh, could you do it at that place near the conference? Uh, there you go. Uh, by, the, by the ball pin? Yeah. Oh, that's somewhere. They're all going to be distracted. With the, they're going to want to go swimming in the ball pin. <laughs> that's going to be very hard to compete with. Are there any questions? I'm happy to answer them. Yes, sir. The first thing, thank you for your speech. Thank you. The second is, as I understand, uh, right now Spring Framework do not officially support relational databases, right? So when do we expect to see the official support for uh, relational databases? Well, so we do support relational databases in a blocking way, right? We've had that for 15 years. But for reactive, we have R2DBC. I hope that'll be done this year, right? I, I hope that'll be in the release train. But we, those projects, the experimental project, that's coming from people on the Spring team. We, we've already got it working. R2DBC is something that we developed, right? We, it's open source. We have contributors, but we started the project. And so we, we fully intend to support it. And I expect by this year that'll all be in GA. Got it. Thank you. No problem. Thank you. Good question. Other questions? Comments, feedback? Who learned something new? Oh, good. OK, I never know. Maybe, maybe you all know this stuff already. I never know when I come to great, great communities like this one. You know, wouldn't surprise me. All right, thank you. <laughs>